This is Geek Gab with your host, Dornall and me, Daddy Warpig. We are back. Geek Gab for Saturday, January 7th, 2023. Feels so good to say. Primarily because it's not 2022 and we haven't had any major problems so far. Well, that's not true, isn't it? <laughs> oh, bad nabbit. We're going to talk about one of them today. But uh, let's start off by uh, Dornall. How was your week? My week's been good. I'm glad you didn't ask about our break because my break was awful. In and around, oh, yeah. uh, in and around glorious holidays. Uh, the rest of the time, I was sick. I was going to say my break was great, and 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 hearing your description of your break, and I was thinking, well, you know, technically that was true for me too. <laughs> But the great stuff was so great, I, I just didn't think about the rest. And and now that right. I'm saying that, it feels a bit odd. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I didn't get the uh, I, I didn't get the benefit of recovering from a miracle. Uh, so, <laughs> your your break probably was a lot rosier than mine. Um, no, uh, Christmas was good, uh, and I spent the following uh, two weeks sick. Other than that, it's all good. It was it all went by in a blur. Okay, I I should catch the audience up with, uh, and I should move my mic closer. So I realized I was not speaking into the mic that I thought I was speaking into. So I'm gonna have to move this one closer so that I can actually sound like I'm in the room and not and not yelling at the audience from a hundred meters away. Yeah, you're at, you're at the fridge trying to figure out what you're going to eat next, shouting at the mic across the room. Yeah. Um, no, no, I'm I'm actually sitting at the desk, folks. I'm here. I'm really here. So, um, this is what my Christmas break was, uh, and I'm going to do this quickly. On October 31st, I went in to see a surgeon. He told me I had metastatic pancreatic cancer. Don't worry, this story has a happy ending. Metastatic pancreatic cancer is fast moving and it will kill you quickly. And so, again, happy ending. Don't worry at this point. Daddy Warpig will turn out fine. Um, put a little Princess Bride thing there, you know. The eels don't eat me at this time. So, um, we schedule the schedule the surgery for November 29th, just about a month later. So that's the earliest they can get me in. Because it turns out that in addition to metastatic pancreatic cancer. I have literally four other operations that have to be done at the same time. I have a huge hernia in the front of my body um, because, uh, and this sounds a lot more metal than it is, the front muscles in my body have separated and have been separated for almost three years. So for three years, I've been rocking around with the front skin on my body, barely holding my insides in. And for the two years before that, they weren't even talking. It was a really sad situation. So, and I have a, a, a smaller hernia. The big hernia went from my belly button all the way up to my xiphoid process to the bottom of my rib cage. So, three years walking around with that. 
begging surgeons to to fix it, and none of them could find it until this guy. Just to show you how tough I am. Um, plus, I had a my um, spleen. I kept on bouncing between sphinx and splint, and I knew neither of those were right. Spleen was dumping blood into my stomach, and so that had to be taken out entirely. And I had some stuff on my liver that had to be excised. So in addition to taking tumors off my pancreas and cutting off a third of my pancreas, which is invasive, basically... You know how in a room, when you want to remodel the room, you have to move all the furniture out of the way to like the left side of the room and then rip up all the carpeting and everything just so you can like do some remodeling on the right side of the room? That's exactly what you have to do in a pancreatic operation. You have to push, literally physically grab a hold of the organs, the surgeon does, and push them all over to the left side of your body to get them out of the way, to get into where the pancreas lies, and then do the operation. Major invasive surgery. So even if everything, you know, is going well, there's a big chance things will go very, very badly. So on the 24th, I got, again, Daddy Warpig does not die at this time. Everything turns out okay. I go to see my family on the 24th to spend three days at my sister's house with my family. We go out to see a movie. Uh, the movie we went to see was the Black Panther because that was literally the only movie. Black Panther 2, Wakanda Forever. Um, quick movie review. It was kind of awful. Uh, that's blown it. away. That's all I have to say. Absolutely blown um, away. So that was great. It was awesome. I had brothers down from where they live, um, many, many hundreds of hundreds of miles away. Uh, sisters who were there, um, we got to celebrate Thanksgiving. I just had an awesome time with my family. And everybody was, you know, everybody was low-key worried about me, but we didn't talk about it except to say, you know, hey, we will see you for Christmas, Daddy Warp, because I was projected to have gone in for the operation and gotten out to be with my family on Christmas. And everybody was just all, you know, we will see you on Christmas. Plus, your life will be massively improved by having this hernia repaired because now I can start to be able to lift heavy things again and do small things like turn my body and, uh, you know, scratch my back and uh, lean over and pick up stuff off the floor. Little things like that that you begin to miss when you've got a hole in your body. Um, so after the 24th, I got back to the place I live. I had a couple days here. And then I went into the hospital and had an operation full, you know, full sedation, major surgery, got out of the major surgery, spent four days in ICU um, because they cut a foot long incision in my body, foot long. Um, you could use it to measure Subway sandwiches, okay? That's how Whoa. foot long it was. Um, and, and this time... They stuck me together with super glue. Now, the last time I had an incision this long, this long, they they stapled me together. And those of you who've been with me on Twitter for a long time might remember this from back in in 2016. Last time they needed to keep my organs in uh, because of a big incision. They stapled me together. Um, it was trippy to just run your fingers down this line of staples and to think about. You know, you're basically a, a home project at that point. Um, 
But this time, it's just glue. And personally, I preferred the staples because they're metal, and I trust metal to hold me together more than polymer. But purple, it was purple colored. Purple colored polymer is what I got. So I went from big steel gray metallic staples to this lavender goop. It was all dried off by the time I saw it, but it was still lavender goop. And I just wasn't 100% comfortable with that, but I decided to roll with it because at that point, I didn't have a choice. It's not like I could go back and say, hey, I'm awake now. I'm completely out of anesthesia. Would you please staple me up? So, because it would have hurt. And, you know, I'm okay with that. So they had me on the good drugs. They had me on Dilaudid in the intensive care. Um, and then they had me on no food. So I lost 17 pounds in the hospital. It took me down to 196 pounds, uh, wow. which is actually healthy weight for a guy who's six foot even. Um, four days in ICU, four days on the floor. And then I went into physical therapy, which wasn't originally the plan, but they decided after seeing how weak I was, after the operation to send me to physical therapy. So I spent another eight or nine days in physical therapy. And um, my mom had accidentally absconded with my clothes. So in physical therapy, they had to rummage around and get me some clothes to wear so I could actually do the exercises. So I ended up with a couple of pairs of scrub pants. It's scrubs, the, the pants from scrubs, like you may have seen doctors wearing everything. And uh, a couple of shirts, one of which, and I'm not kidding about this, was a T-shirt from some you know, hardcore veteran t-shirt website, which I would absolutely never wear under normal circumstances. Um, but it was a daddy war pig t-shirt. No it way. Had the full beard, like you see in the picture, it had the hair almost exactly like you see in the picture before you they gave me in the hospital after surviving this major 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 operation where they hollowed me out like a gourd pushed all my organs aside to renovate my insides and then pushed them all back and uh, stitched me up with super glue, stuck me back together with super glue. They gave me as my reward a daddy war pig t shirt because that's the <laughs> most daddy war pig thing that you could imagine happening. So I there it, it is. <clears throat> Even hospital people bow down to the majesty of daddy war pig. So I then get out of the hospital and I go back to the place I live for, you know, a few days and I get to go back to my sister's house. And I may have mentioned her before. This is the sister who lives in a, who lives in a mansion. So this is where we hold our big parties at the family because we have a huge family. Um, and uh, we held Christmas at her house. And I got to stay there again for another three days. And got to see my brothers again. Got to see uh, all my family. And I just had the most wonderful Christmas. It was amazing. And so all the promises they made, 
all the promises we made to each other on Thanksgiving that they absolutely would see me on Christmas was fulfilled. Now, what the doctor told me when I got out of the operation was that he removed all of these tissues and the tumor he removed from my pancreas, all of the other stuff was benign. And the tumor he moved from my pancreas and tested around it, there was no cancerous growths. And so that means they amazing. got all of it. Absolutely and, amazing. And so I wouldn't have to do chemotherapy and I wouldn't have to do, um, what's the other one? Chemotherapy, radiation therapy. Radiation. So that was astounding and great news coming out of the hospital. But um, I asked everybody for prayers on Facebook and on other places. And so I got some great news, even better news than that. Uh, you basically uh, had the whole internet praying for you, buddy. Yeah. I had literally thousands of people praying for me. So this is news I haven't posted yet online, and I need to post it today. Um, I got the Christmas. I got to spend it with my family. So I did not die on the table. And the joke I made to my family, which apparently does not go over well with people who don't appreciate black humor. Um, so it killed with my family, and it would kill with veterans. Um but the joke died last night or uh, Thursday night. The joke I made with my family was my gift for everybody for Christmas that I couldn't give a gift to was, you know, I came back from the hospital alive. Hmm. That was my gift. That's how generous That's... I am, folks. I didn't die. I came back for you. But Man, apparently that was that's real, real thoughtful of you. That was real thoughtful of you. Is is that a completely grim joke that just nobody smiles at but me? Oh, uh, nah. It's I, I think it's 50-50. I'm not sure it's as dark as you think it is. Okay. I just... But it's, I, it's not going to win over every audience. That's for sure. Okay. That, that's an audience-specific joke. I yeah. smile at it. I, I don't care. I think it's funny. So anyways, this is the best news that I got. The doctor, because pancreatic cancer, even if you excise it, even if you don't have any of it, you've got to keep a watch on it for the rest of your life because there's always a chance it'll come back. And you have to keep a watch on it regularly because when it does come back, you have to jump on that early. You have to catch that early and kill it because it will instantly, you know, spread just it's what killed Steve Jobs. It's is one of the most aggressive cancers there is. It is literally a death sentence. Um, but the doctor sent off that tumor, the tumor that it, that was cancerous, to uh, be dissected, you know, chopped into little slivers, and studied. And this is what they found. The a cancerous tumor forms something they call uh, necrotic fat tissue. That's literally fat cells on your pancreas that die. Um, so they're just dead tissue hanging on to you. Apparently, that's different than gangrene, but I don't know how. Um, and if they grow large enough, they form a cyst, which becomes hard, which can start growing into your pancreas and cause all sorts of bad stuff. And mine had already insisted. So I had to get this thing removed at all costs anyway. So I had to have this anyway. So they cut off a third of my pancreas. It turns out when they sliced it open. Um, oh, and, and, if it isn't cancer that causes it, there are a few other things that causes it. And all of these other things that causes it are all bad, 
that you have to uh, keep an eye on them regularly too. They're all really bad, really bad for your pancreas. And they all, if it's not happening right now, can come back just like pancreatic cancer. So you have to keep an eye on them for the rest of your life too. Uh, so it turns out what they told me is I don't have cancer and I never did. Huh. What, Unbelievable. What the doctor had told me back in October 31st was wrong. He saw this cyst on, uh, on a CT scan, um, which is a lot more, has a lot of finer resolution than an MRI scan. And because he saw two of them and a fast growing mass on my liver, uh, which went from nothing to this big mass in a matter of months, he thought it was plus elevated cancer markers in my blood. He thought it was cancer because that is all really cancerous. Oh, here's two masses that look like they grow from cancer, plus another mass on his liver that went from nothing to big, huge in a couple of months, and he has elevated cancer markers in his blood. That's cancer and pretty aggressive cancer. So he, uh, I didn't have cancer though, and I never did. Just some things that were happening all at the same time, coincidentally. Five separate different health problems all happening at the same time because Daddy Warpig can't do things just once. I got to I gotta challenge myself when I get sick. I got to do the hardcore sicknesses, folks. Mere minor little health problems like, you know, just one cancerous mass or potentially cancerous mass are not for me. I'm a bad dude. I am tough and you do not want to mess with me. So the good news is I don't have cancer and I never did. Bad news is there is some, there is occasionally something going on with my pancreas, which I have to keep a watch on, but I'm fine. Uh, I am a okay. Um, I've been down with a little flu like thing. Maybe it's the newest strain of COVID that's really mild, but it's been kind of wiping me out, but I've still been working. I've still been doing things. And um, I am so deeply appreciative of all the of all the prayers and all the support that everybody has offered me. It has given me the strength to get through this, the strength to um, get through my physical therapy. Um, I have healed quickly and thoroughly. There has been no internal bleeding. There's been no infections. Um, all of the nurses and doctors, when they saw how fast I was healing, were astonished. They were uh, impressed and happy. I got on heavy-duty painkillers because I had to, um, but I did not have an addiction problem. I turned those off quickly. Um and when I got back home for the first two days, I was having some severe pain and I just toughened it out. Two days, heavy pain. I just said, screw it. I'm not taking any more um, heavy painkillers. Uh, didn't take Tylenol, didn't take uh, uh, anything else heavier. And I just went through it because it was like, I'm done with painkillers. So, yeah, absolutely believe absolutely believe uh, the prayers helped, absolutely believe that there was concrete uh, concrete things that happened to me that blessed me because of all the prayers. Um, and I thank everybody who, who prayed for me. Um, and I needed to tell you, because I don't want people to think that I had cancer when it turns out I didn't. Um, but I do want them to know that their prayers mattered um, and that they mattered to me deeply. So Daddy Warpig is A-OK. -okay. Best news of the year. I'm done. Truly, truly blessed. I, I can't follow up on that. Uh, I That done. Good show.
Daddy Warpig's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Uh, praise God for sure. That I, I've never seen the power of prayer work quite like that. The, in hindsight, in hindsight, the, the clues that it might not have been a serious cancer were there. The way you described the masses that it's pancreatic cancer, but the tumors are all on your pancreas instead of spread throughout your body, right? Like the clues were there, but that didn't make it any less serious. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, you're truly, truly uh, blessed. That's amazing. So I still have to get an MRI in two months and I have to get an MRI annually just to keep track to see if these cysts, if they return, because if they return, I have to go in and get them removed again, but it's cool. That's amazing. Do you, uh, do you want to talk about gaming news from while you were recovering? Yeah, let's do this. I, I missed a lot. No, I'm not going to complain about that. I already complained about that in the game. We don't have a lot of time. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Joy of War Gaming, John Mollison uh, did his whole, the next uh, Bro SR big patron event, the Orc Lords. That happened in December. Um, uh, did you actually catch any of that? I didn't catch any of that after the first like couple of days where someone was complaining about getting wiped out. Uh, someone got knocked out early, which uh, I'm surprised only one person got knocked out early. Um, <clears throat> uh, he did this great thing for I don't know for you guys who follow along with uh, with the weird uh, Bro SR gaming experiments on the heels of. Brovenloft, uh, where uh, Kess uh, innovated this amazing land grab, where he just threw up a map and uh, told a bunch of people, okay, pick a pick a movie monster and pick a location to start from, and then we'll all fight over this territory. Um, John Mollison took those that setup and the stuff we learned from that, okay, what worked, what didn't work, and he made the same type of game for December uh, called Rise of the Orc Lords. And uh, it was a month-long thing. It was restricted to a month. He had the starting locations set aside uh, so that uh, it wasn't a random land grab. Uh, and he, he locked down everybody's character options. Uh, so that there would be some semblance of a game balance, and then he just let it go. And you can find all the rules and, and the results at orclords.blogspot.com. But uh, there's about, I think there's a dozen guys, uh, mostly the old, <clears throat> the big Broasar patrons, had to jump in, and they were plotting and scheming and moving armies all over the map. Uh, and it was fun to watch, but two things two things I want to say about it. It was fun to watch, but the moves were all handled weeks or days in advance. And they weren't necessarily trickled in. So it, in, it didn't have the sort of high tension day-by-day -day, uh, excitement for a spectator the way Brovenloft did. But what you got is at the start of the week, a bunch of crazy stuff happened. And you can, and I, we haven't heard everything yet. You know, John hasn't done a tell all. Uh, not a lot of the org lords have spoken up yet. But uh, there's lots of stuff going on in the background. And what we saw was this crazy mad dash around the map of a dozen, you know, two dozen orc armies running around uh, trying to you know, beat the others to various treasure hordes or, uh, and you watch them form alliances and break alliances. And the final week was a spectacular uh, cascade of uh, alliances broken and backs stabbed, uh, you know, and player versus player that we were sort of hoping for. Uh, let's see if I can, I'll, I'll see if I can put up this page for the 
folks watching on YouTube. But here's Rise of the Orc Lords with the final results. Uh, it was it was fun to watch, and uh, you can read all the details. But Wima, uh, he basically got eliminated right away. He was one of the orcs closest to the center of the map, and he basically got double teamed. Uh, that was sad. A uh, big winner by a huge margin, Porcus Orcus, also known as uh, played by the same player who plays Macho Mandalf, won that event. So that was the one of the big innovations on Brovenloft that John made for Rise of the Orc Lords. Actually had a scoring system and a win condition. And so at the end of the month, when the smoke uh, was cleared, all the points were tallied up, and we have a winner. Uh, it was a lot of fun to pay attention to. There wasn't as much uh, opportunity for spectator or player interaction. Like we originally said that this this would be an open game where people could play in. Uh, people who weren't playing orc armies could play in. Uh, and that turned out not to be the case. John was absolutely swamped. It was way more work to run this game than than he thought. Uh, so what did we learn from that? Um, uh, we learned a couple of things. Uh, he, he structured the game around week-long moves, and that turned out to be part of the problem for him. The... Uh, the, yeah, Mega Buster Shepherd says, poor Macho Mandalf, the second time his domain's been nuked. That's right, if you're following, uh, I don't know if it's been announced on Twitter, if you're following the Trollopolis campaign, um, another, the lights went out in Trollopolis and a nuke destroyed uh, Baron Pug. So, oh well. And we have no idea what's going on with that yet. Uh, but anyway, back to the Orc Lords. Uh, it was tough to handle the week-long moves because uh, you have to write, if you're managing your armies, you have to write a lot of orders with lots of contingencies uh, over what might happen over the next seven days. Um, uh, so that made some some of, thing, some of the things that happened, I guess, were a little weird. Uh, I'm not going to... You can read uh, John's report at the at the end. I've got it up here, Decembork final results. But pop that up on the screen. Uh, what else do we learn? Uh, yeah, and the posting the results ahead of time made it a non-interactive experience for other people. Where Brovenloft was presented as uh, a Dungeons and Dragons world, where you could play games in that world while the patrons were fighting over territory, this was completely just a strict war game, something you might expect from the joy of war gaming. Uh, and that's pretty much what I got out of it. Uh, I, I'm going to push John to <clears throat> sort of gather together his learnings, as they say, and uh, and give us some more insight into how to run it because I'm looking forward to the next one. Uh, I think this is a great iteration on the Broasar style of uh, big patron war games, and I think we're going to see another one uh, change it up a little bit. Uh, there's already talk about doing uh, something with along the same lines, something with a dwarf mountain. Right, sort of like a dwarf fortress. Uh, another another person who who is me has suggested doing it with street gangs at the street level, either like a 1920s gangbuster or a futuristic cyberpunk uh, gang. Uh, this this idea, this game structure, I think if we can nail this down, I think we can do anything with it. And I, I think it's a new game structure. The idea of the, the, uh, you know, uh, controlling hexes on a map not new. Uh, uh, having having a land grab not necessarily new, but in the context of a role playing game, uh, uh, brilliant. And 
uh, John's innovations on <clears throat> wind conditions and and strict rules on how to play. Once again, the idea is not new, but the rules themselves, uh, uh, amazing. And Jeff Rowe Johnson says the time boxing of these things to a month of high intensity gaming is a great attribute of these things. Yeah, that's one of the that's one of the innovations. Is is there? Uh, you're playing in real time, but there's a time limit. You only have a month to accomplish all the things, any goals that you have. Uh, great innovation. Uh, and the, uh, the other thing that's that's been pointed out a few times is being able to play online, that sort of always on game that we've kind of had since the advent of email. You know, play by play by message board, play by email have uh, always been there, but the high intensity of email and Discord, real-time voice communication with the layer of social media on top where you can get people like me just reading and talking about it and thinking about it and 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 interacting with the game one way or another uh putting it all together uh biggest biggest thing to happen in gaming in 2022 i can't agree more um so if you missed it go back check out the uh blog orglords.blogspot.com see what he's doing uh, there's gonna be so much good stuff coming up in the next year i love these guys did you have any questions about the the game or what happened, D Dubs? No, I just wanted to make the observation that uh, um, this grew out of you know the Bureau SR's experimentation with Bronstein uh, style play combined with a few innovations of their own and. It's genuinely new. It's genuinely experimental. And uh, it started with the original patron war in June of 2020, I think. And, uh, ha and then, uh, you know, uh, Brovenloft, which started as a joke and then ramped up to something real. We had the what was not supposed to happen, but which happened and which was awesome, the September run-up to actual uh, Brovenloft, and then things happening in Brovenloft, and then December, um, it, it, you just keep on refining and refining and refining. Uh, oh, July 2021, my bad. Um, other than getting the month and the year wrong, I was almost right. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it's great. It's great to see, uh, all these things happening. It's great to see genuine innovation coming from players up because it seems like a lot of the people doing design aren't, aren't doing a lot of, uh, a lot of innovation. Um, no, there's, there's very little, there's very little game design being done anywhere in the industry. Just a lot of content creation. If you and, get, the, and, if you get my distinction. And it's like, this is an entirely new type of role gaming, Right. They it's it, it's it's not totally unfamiliar. Bradford Walker brings up uh, diplomacy, right? The diplomacy is a game I've always been told I would love, but that's it's never it never appealed to me. Uh, but in the context of a tabletop role playing game, <clears throat> something that I, I do enjoy doing. Uh, it adds that extra layer. And what we're seeing is a 
game that is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, just yeah. when you put it all together, it's so rich. It's so uh, entertaining from both sides of the table. That That's where the innovation comes from. I mean, no innovation is mm-hmm. sui generis. You know, it's not something that springs out of your head fully formed with no connection to anything before. Um, I mean, D&D didn't start with no connection to anything before. It grew out of Bronstein. But this is like, you know, Bronstein and Kriegspiel adding diplomacy and then adding in the real time, one-to-one time, that the Broessar rediscovered, um, and then adding in um, adding in the notion of of patrons, which are essentially high level D and D characters uh, who have domains and domain actions. I mean, it, it really is something, something innovating and innovative and something new. I don't think that it's a form of war gaming, but I don't think there's any war game that's been run like this, where you have. Uh, yeah, the to to. to... I want to go deeper on that to paraphrase someone I saw on Spitter spoken, speaking on Twitter, and I don't recall who it was, but the uh, wargaming uh, is tightly focused on individual scenarios. Uh, they're, they're very tactical. I, you have, you know, here's the scenario. Here's how to construct the terrain. Each player gets a certain size army, a certain number of points for their army. They, you know, bring the figures, paint them, build their army, and they lay it out and then they play the game. You know, well, what, what would happen in this battle or for historical battles? You know, what, what, all right, you control Napoleon's forces, I'll control the Italians and we'll see what happens, right? The, those sorts of things. But this is strategic. This, bl- this completely blows wargaming up to the strategic level. Yeah, and and you add in a layer of politics, you add in a layer of, um, and by politics, I mean um, interpersonal politicking, uh, where the leaders are communicating with each other. That's where the kind of diplomacy, what is similar to diplomacy, but really what came out of the, you know, high-level patron play of, of, of D and D, uh, and was present in early D and D. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is basically D and D campaigns without limited in time, without focusing on the player character level. Um, and, and I think the purest, I think you can run one that's hybrid where, you know, PC, where this has an impact on campaigns and where PCs can get involved. But I think that both Decembork and Brovenloft proved that this kind of game works best when it's not run with an eye towards making, there's just too much work to run this kind of game than adding the additional, you know, level of work to figure out where where opportunities for um, individual parties to adventure are going to fit in. I think the way that that would have to work is that you would have to have a second game master. And there's too much secrets. There's too many things happening 
that the primary game, the primary, you know, referee doesn't know what's going on. He has no idea what's going on. And in order to really provide opportunities for players, you'd have to be privy to everything. So you'd know what was going on when you sent players to this particular domain or that other domain or that there's this, you know, scouting party marching at this time. So the players are going to encounter it on a random encounter. I think that's um, another, I think that's another innovation um, or at least a departure from the type of game described in advanced Dungeons and Dragons in uh, uh, because AD and D really is written from the perspective of a single, you know, omniscient, dungeon master who nobody else even gets to read the dungeon master's guy right. uh, he he, <clears throat> he makes all the attack and damage rolls he might as well hold the character sheets that sort of thing um that, that's that's another innovation that if we if we break that convention or we break that rule and say okay well, let's assume that everybody knows and has read all the rules that's another thing that breaks open patron play wide open and that enables you to say something like you just said hey we're gonna need a referee just for this this you know these continental level battles and and you might even need you know a couple of depending on how many patrons you have and what's going on on the board you you really do need referees just to include players you would need maybe two or three referees to keep track of secrets, you know, that that the patrons have to be open and honest with and say, here's all my secrets. And then you'd have to trust those guys not to be in on the scheming themselves. You'd have to have very trustworthy people. Um, and uh, I know Jeffro is already picking that up and running with it um, because of his particular theories on who the game is meant for but in any case um this type of game runs better and clearer when you're not worrying about the individual party focus because there's too much going on for the main dungeon master to keep track of this is by its very nature with just one dungeon master, a strategic level game, and it's hard to shoo individual parties in. Um, I shoot individual parties in by just saying, okay, here's this really big effect I want to have, and then clearing that with the GM and then running my adventures a little bit railroady on the introduction, basically plucking the players up and putting them someplace and saying, okay, this is where you start the adventure, which kind of violates a couple of the principles of the Bro SR, but it was necessary to put them in a place where they could actually have an adventure and actually affect things on the strategic level. Um, if you use the players can go anywhere, then it's hard to come up with hundreds of things that can affect the strategic level because there's so many people interacting and the situation changes so much. And I can make that up off the top of my head for my own campaign, but taking, you know, let's say there's 20 different places they could go taking 20 different campaign shaking events to um, to the one GM and saying, okay, here's these 20 things they might be able to do. What do you think of all of them? And getting all of them approved is, is just not feasible. Ideally you'd be able to do that, but I think the only way practical to do something like that would be to literally have, every GM be subsidiary GMs and they're they're the ones who are aware of all the machinations 
and they're the ones who run um, parties, you'd have to divide the map up into zones and have specific subsidiary DMs in each of those zones. And they're the ones who are aware of the machinations in each of those zones. And they're the ones who can be responsible for, you know, campaign shattering events in those zones. And when a party lands in a zone, they're the ones who'd have to run the adventure uh, for the party. Uh, based on what the party wants to do. Yeah, that's I'm how not that saying... Yeah, that's a way it could work. Um, lost you, lost me there. No, I, I was, I was done talking. You, I wanted to stop talking so you could get in your point. <laughs> no, that wasn't my point. Um, about so, anyways, these are. This is a genuinely innovate, genuine innovation in, uh, you know, a, a war gaming slash role playing hybrid taking place on the patron level. Um, that is as it stands, mostly divorced from individual campaigning out of necessity that we need to, that, that is a currently under experiments to kind of thrash it out, see how it can best run. And uh, I'm excited. It's uh, part of the great new stuff coming out of the uh, Bro SR. And uh, like people... Uh, People who sleep on the Bro SR are sleeping on the uh, uh, on the biggest news in on the biggest news in the hobbies. Uh, yeah, uh, on, on, in the hobby today, in, probably the biggest news since the release of the uh, original open gaming license. Oh, I see what you did there. We've got uh, uh, it's massive. He, people should be paying attention, and uh, it's uh, the the ideas are so good, and we can see that because uh, the evidence is there. We uh, these games show just how interesting and powerful uh, the ideas and the innovations are. And uh, speaking of speaking of the biggest news, let's talk about the other biggest news in gaming uh speaking of the ogl uh we got a leak from wizards of the coast a subsidiary of hasbro corporation on the open gaming license um do you uh should we get some background does everybody know what the o open gaming license is um so let's start with this background Hasbro is having, last year, Hasbro was having a really, really, really crappy year. All of their toys are in trouble. Their toy lines are in trouble. Basically, everything else at the company is in the crapper. And because of Stranger Things and because of Critical Role, um, d d is suddenly hot. It is suddenly selling like mad. And magic is continuing to really sell. So the word that has been spread around, and I don't know if this is from leaks. I don't know if, if this is from something else. I am getting this like secondhand, but this is what a lot of, you know, news sites are reporting is that D D and magic the gathering which is to say wizards of the coast is subsidizing the rest of hasbro so when you talk about hasbro right now and it doesn't mean this situation won't change next quarter or the quarter after that right now 
Hasbro is Wizards of the Coast plus a bunch of low-selling crap. Take that for what you will. So, Hasbro needs, needs to milk both of those franchises for as much as they can. Mm -hmm. And the CEO of Hasbro said publicly, on the record, this is not a rumor, this is not a leak, that Dungeons, the Dungeons and Dragons brand name is massively under monetized. Not under monetized, massively under monetized. So that gave me some pause. He also said that they are looking to now this is not his exact words um to s exploit it like mobile like uh people in the digital sphere do like people in the digital sphere monetize their ip that's the kind of monetization they're looking for mm -hmm. uh, digital sphere is a direct quote the rest of that is my paraphrasing so i don't I don't want you to take that and say, oh, you know, this is exactly what he said. I'm, I'm paraphrasing there. Um, which to my mind means, is my interpretation, mobile gaming, micropayments for everything. And also to my mind, literally the digital sphere which means exploiting virtual tabletop gaming. So there was a recent leak on the OGL 1.1. Everybody getting upset about what Hasbro or what Wizards of the Coast was doing in trying to attack the old open gaming license and trying to attack this other stuff, and everybody was aghast and up in the air about it. But I want to let you know that I, your host, had predicted to the very detail this leak. I had predicted fully two days before the leak came out the reasoning why it happened, what was going to be happening. And I gave myself a five-year time horizon. I said, look, if this doesn't happen in the next five years, call this prediction fail. Uh, and I'll, I'll gladly admit to failure. And the leak happened two days later. So it came true faster than the time horizon I gave myself. And I'm going to read my prediction. Because this will be the basis of the discussion. My thought process. Given Watsi's statements about D&D &D being under-monetized as a brand, their desires to monetize D&D &D like mobile games are monetized off the backs of Dungeon Masters to boot, their recent statements about a new 1.1 version of the OGL, which actually isn't an OGL, but a kind of hybrid trademark open royalty license, Wizards of the Coast wisely avoided back in uh, 2000, and they're already on a slippery slope demands for royalties. Watsi is clearly being run by greed heads who are seeking a much larger level of control over D&D &D in order to extract more money from D&D &D customers without having to provide more value. I'm surmising that Watsi lawyers are planning even now to bring a suit to claw back the release of D&D mechanics, creatures, etc. in the 3.5 system reference document under the terms of the 1.0 open gaming license 
in an attempt to invalidate all the we don't get paid for it D&D and free to customers D&D out in the wild. They want royalties on everything. Axe, Stars Without Number, Pathfinder, everything. They may even seek to invalidate the 1.0a OGL itself. This company is going the same route as Activision, EA, John Deere, Mercedes-Benz, and so many others. They exert control to extract or seek to extract money from customers without providing value. In fact, in many cases, they provide worse value in their attempts to maximize the money they extract. Suing over the SRD is a logical step in this progression and only a matter of time. I'm not saying they will succeed. I'm predicting that they will try. This is a prediction with a time horizon of, let's say, five years. Even if it happens after five years, I'll be wrong and happy to admit it. But I don't think I will. And that was Posted on January 2nd, 2023, on both Facebook and the RPG site uh, message boards. I couldn't post it to Twitter because I was on a Twitter ban. <laughs> um, you know, it happens. And then uh, two days later was the leak that Wizards of the Coast was doing almost everything I predicted. We haven't heard any word about the lawsuits yet, but uh, the leak we had about 1.1 has been entirely on point. Yeah, it's incredible. <clears throat> um, the Of course, you saw it coming uh, it, when you read the, uh, you know, what the Hasbro employee said. And we got that leak, uh, that that OGL leak. They are, uh, as uh, Bradford confirms, that Wizard said that the 1.0 version of the open gaming license is unauthorized. Um, and the leak, uh, uh, the new version, the 1.1, 1 .1, uh, apparently is 10 times longer. The uh, let me see if I can find it in this article here. Uh, I got this article from Gizmodo. Uh, oh, and, I have the and, same one open in a, in a yeah. cab myself. Uh, 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 anyway, the, the, the new document is 9,000 words, where the original OGL is just under 900. It's, it's completely absurd. And uh, what you said about the... Um, about the types of monetization, the types of things they want to monetize uh, is, is right over the mark. Uh, it, all A lot of that extra verbiage is stuff about uh, blockchain, NFTs, uh, videos, uh, live streams, stuff like Critical Role. You know, they, I don't think Critical Role is named, but it's, it's directed at those people. They want to get a cut of all of it. They, they are claiming that Let's Plays of D&D &D are now forbidden. That you right. can't do them. Oh, oh but they're going to be magnanimous about it uh, because there's, there's going to be a tier system where if you're not really making any money, then you, you, have, you have to tell them if you're doing any of this, if you make any money or anything. Um, but no. here... Literally, but here it is. If you're doing a let's play, you can't do it under the terms of the OGL commercial. You have to do it under the terms of the OGL fan, which means you cannot make any money at it unless you make a separate contract with Wizards of the Coast. You cannot <laughs> make any money on a let's play. If you have... Uh, YouTube ads on your Let's Play, you are violating the terms of your license 
and they can shut you down permanently. That's what they're claiming. I'm not saying that's actually the legal rights they really have. That's what they're claiming. <laughs> and we're kind of down and, and, in the weeds here of the details, but and, and that's uh, but that's where that, that's where the rubber's going to hit the road. I mean, the f first thing they're trying to invalidate the OGL 1.0. Uh, I am not a lawyer, but the common consensus I've seen so far is that the open gaming license 1.0 might be revocable. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think they can enforce it. Um, Ryan Dancy was the author. He's the uh, Wizards employee who authored the OGL. And he's he's on record saying, because he knows what the OGL was about, right? He's on record saying that, you know, this is... Uh, uh, this is what the OGL was for, uh, which was just to allow people to make content based on the SRD. Um, Bradford Walker says, Ryan Nancy's article says, Watsy can't do what it wants. He'll swear so under oath. Uh, I don't I don't know if Ryan, uh, Ryan Nancy's going to have some uh, valuable context there, but the the legal details are still murky. Uh, it's, it's absolutely nuts. Here's the thing that comes to, this is the big problem they're going to have in court, is that in addition to the legalese of the, the, the actual text of the contract, there comes a, other things that can be admitted is statements of the people uh, who authored the contract of what they intended the contract to mean are admissible in court. So everything Ryan Dancy said in his role as Watsi's official employee who was in charge of the open gaming license, every time he said something on the record that indicated the mindset of Wizards of the, of the, Wizards of the Coast when they release the initial open gaming license, everything he said about, we intend this to be X, we want it to be Y, that is legally admissible in court. And his testimony about what they intended it to mean is obviously legally admissible. And so mm -hmm. that's a huge because he said it over and over and over again. He gave many interviews. He made he gave facts on the Wizards of the Coast website. He, you know, issued clarifying statements. He responded to companies asking questions about, well, we want to make a video game. Are video games allowed? Yes, you can make a video game. However, compiled code is that is not human readable, does not comply with the OGLs, so you're going to have to make your code human readable. That will comply with your requirements under the OGL. He literally told them how to make their video games comply so video games are authorized. And so they're going to have a massive problem with, um, mm -hmm. with trying to prove that the OGL doesn't mean what it clearly means. Now, I will confess that back in 2000, when I first read through the OGL and understand what it meant, my, my first thought about it was, I don't think Wizards of the Coast realizes the ex what they've done. I don't think they have looked to the future and understood exactly how much leeway they've given third-party publishers. I think Ryan Dancy kind of slipped one past the plate on the company. I think he gave away a lot more than they realized. They thought the OGL was going to genuinely just allow people to 
publish derivative campaign settings and such um, and modules, third-party modules for, you know, for D and D, um, I I really really don't think that the people who worked at Wizards of the Coast looked forward to a day where they saw Pathfinder coming. Um, I, on the other hand, looked at the implications of the license, and I knew something like Pathfinder could always happen. Because all you had to do is just not use the D20 license, which was a separate contract. Because that's the only way you could really do it. It gets messy if you tried to combine those two, which is what they tried to do with 4th Edition's uh, gaming system license. They tried to combine those two, and it's just a flipping mess, um, which is what the statement in my prediction was, uh, was about. Um, about wisely they avoided this in 2000. That was uh, what I was referring to. Um, I knew they were giving away more than the company realized at the time. I think Ryan Dancy realized it, though. And he kept on making statements about all of it. So I don't know. Um, uh, now, here's the thing about the even the original OGL which which i found was really interesting um uh, speaking of ryan dancy uh, i uh, he has killed vampire the eternal struggle the collectible card game twice at two different companies uh, he really has it in for the vampire players <laughs> but but uh, i was really active in the fan community at those times and the question always came up of well, why can't White Wolf just print their own cards? So why can't we just make fan cards? Why, don't, why, why can't we just continue? And the main problem was not game mechanics. You can't claim copyright or anything on game mechanics. If you're wondering why I'm talking about Vampire, you can... Uh, if you're making a derivative game, you can violate trademark. You can violate the Dungeons and Dragons trademark. Uh, you can violate patents. Magic the Gathering has uh, famous patents. The Deckmaster logo, it's a trademark. And the, they patented some of the uh, terms in the game. For example, in Magic the Gathering, when you turn a card sideways to use its effect, it's called tapping. You will tap a piece of land for its mana, or you will tap a creature to have it attack. <clears throat> you cannot create a, a collectible card game or a card game that uses tap as a mechanic. You can use the same exact mechanic. Legend of the Five Rings calls it bowing. Uh, Vampire the Eternal Struggle in its current incarnation um, uses locking. That was part that of the agreement. Day. Right. That that patent uh, expired in 2014. Oh, it did it. Well, regardless, uh, regardless, the uh, the current producers of Vampire uh, had to make that change in order to get all the licensing they wanted from White Wolf. That was a whole big deal. But my point is that you can violate trademarks, you can violate patents, but there is nothing about the game mechanics in D&D that you can violate. So this leads me to an interesting observation that I shared with, or, or that uh, is also shared by um, Gelatinous Rube on YouTube. I actually caught his live stream yesterday, which was, yeah, I don't think the OGL ever did anything. Gelatinous Rube, I believe, got that from another live stream that I also watched. And the copyright and patent issues are a little more complicated than what he said. First off, none of the D&D mechanics are patented, so that doesn't matter. Uh, second off, the extent to which 
the SRD is copyrighted, you cannot copy the text in the SRD. Mm -hmm. If you use word for word the text in the SRD without using the OGL, and that's what we're talking about. People are going forward into the future talking about, or the, that's what Gelatinous Rube was talking about. People are going into the future trying to avoid using the OGL. Do not copy the text of the SRD. Don't. Because you will get hit on a copyright violation and they can legally sue you and they have the moral right to sue you. If you do not, if you, if you copy that text, that is a copyright violation. They can hammer you down and legally should be able to hammer you down because that's no different from copying text directly from anybody. Um, and I'm saying they're in the moral right to do that. Sorry. The mechanics themselves are unprotected. You cannot copyright mechanics. You have to patent them. But you can copyright the text describing those mechanics. So if, if you have text that says, this is the Constitution attribute, it represents the general physical um, toughness and health of this of your character. It represents how uh, how healthy and hearty you are, how well you resist disease, how well you resist um, burning, how well you resist, and so on. And that's the exact paragraph. You absolutely cannot use those words. You have to take that concept, that idea of health and write your own description, okay? You can use the concept of attributes. That's a game mechanic, that's fine. You can use the concept of a specific attribute representing health or hardiness or toughness. That's a game mechanic, that's fine. But do not on your life copy their text, you will get hit for violating their copyright. Or you could get hit. And I will tell you that to be safe, you also might want to avoid using the term constitution. That's up to you. Lots of people have used lots of different names. So you might want to use a different name for Constitution just to be safe. Um, it has been known in different lawsuits with different judges or different juries. Because a lot of times this isn't black. You don't get black and white solutions to lawsuits. A lot of times... You get a jury to say, oh, well, we recognize that you did something naughty in part, even though the law says otherwise. So we're going to off, we're going to give, you know, uh, some damages to Wizards of the Coast. And um, we're going to, you know, whatever. Once again, what the law actually says and what juries do sometimes don't coincide. Um, this is why rule aids during the 80s was exact mechanics but used different terms and they got hit anyway. Um, I'm just telling you that with a company that has big, deep pockets and can afford to sue you and sue you and sue you, Usually they're going to win. And that's not just me saying that. Uh, and that's the part that uh, has been that, bothering me. That's That's been wiggling that's around my head. I know saying that. That's a lot <laughs> hard. Alexander McChris said that on, on the RPG site in, a, in one of the threads about this. 
that West that's, of the Coast might win anyway just because they have more money. Uh, that's that, that's the thing that's been bothering me. Uh, a lot of people are very confident that that uh, lawsuit, even a class action lawsuit uh, or whatever, will stop or, or undo this nonsense because uh, to a lot of people it seems legally uh, absurd. But if Wizards of the Coast and or Hasbro are willing to fight for it, they've got the money. And I don't know. Tabletop gaming is a, actually a pretty small market until you consider the crazy uh, breakout products like Critical Role. Uh, this isn't a this isn't a massive massive industry. No. Um. I I have to be very careful and very precise with the words I'm about to say. Lawsuits are expensive they are insanely expensive you will pay a lawyer literally one hundred dollars for ten minutes work one hundred dollars for ten minutes work okay and lawsuits like this can last as long as the company who's suing you wants to make them last and you may end up with tens or hundreds of hours billable from a lawyer. And they can last for years. Okay? And they're not just expensive for people who are in them. They are, they are stressful. They are... Um, just stomach churningly stressful. They're possibly. Uh, I will proffer evidence from two things. One, I'll proffer evidence from um, your boy Zach, who was involved in a lawsuit, and his uh, his experience, his witness to this. He said this exact same thing. And I was once involved in a lawsuit, um, exactly this type of lawsuit. And I had to undergo a great deal of stress just to go through it. So I am telling you, just sue them or the law is on my side. Not everyone has the constitution to endure a lawsuit. Not everyone has the money to survive a lawsuit. And so... All of these technical details you're setting up, yes, it's absolutely true. That may be, okay, that may be true. Honest to gosh, you may be true on the legal details. That doesn't mean you're going to prevail in court because you may run out of money or you may just get beaten down until you can't take it anymore and you agree to settle. Out-of-court settlements are so very common because they stop the bleeding. The bleeding of money and the bleeding of your stress. I'm just telling you the truth, folks. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm out here saying things that are not nice. They're not pretty. They're not how the world should work. But they're kind of how the world does work. Um, so I have to keep my mouth shut about anything else related to that subject, but, um, I'm just, I'm just glad I'm not producing any, uh, RPG product. Uh, cause I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to mess with any license at all for anything. The goal Ryan Dancy had when he made the original OGL was to set Dungeons & Dragons free so that no corporation would ever be able to control Dungeons & Dragons again. Even if it was under a different name, even if it was under a different set of uh, mechanics, that Dungeons & Dragons belonged to the players and hobbyist... Um, 
companies. And I honestly believe that legally speaking, if you camouflage it enough, but use the same mechanics, you'll be on solid ground. Here's another thing. This is another tricky thing. And that's, that's, the point I, that's the point I was trying to make. Don't engage in this license at all. Like you said before, you know, the copyright violation isn't copying the text of the SRD, the system resource document. Do not engage in, in these licenses at all. Yes. Do as camouflage as you say, if you need to. Do not copy tables directly from the SRD. Tables can be copyrighted. I, I read somebody writing on the RPG site who said, well, tables are based on a formula. They, they're not, you can't copyright a formula. Yes, that's fine. You can't copyright a formula, but you can copyright a table. That's why when someone was making a retro clone of the Marvel superhero system, uh, which was called Face Rip, the Marvel mechanics, they did not publish the original table, the Marvel table itself. They published the underlying formula upon which the table was based because you can be sued for copyright violation for publishing the table. What I'm telling you is those original two guys who are saying, don't worry about it, you're absolutely free, Game mechanics can't be copyrighted. You can just do whatever you want with the SRD. No, do not listen to those guys. They're a little bit kind of sort of right, but it's bad info. It is more complicated than that. And I'm sorry to say it because I know, you know, gelatinous root. And don't listen to what he said on his live stream either. <laughs> you can't be cavalier about how you approach this. You really do have to know and understand the basics about it, okay? Do not copyright the exact text from the SRD. Do not copy, I'm sorry, do not copy the exact test from the SRD. Do not copy tables. Use the underlying um, formula. That is fine. And do not, if you're going to use game mechanics, camouflage them in some way, rename them. Even if they're no longer patented, um, the two companies John mentioned who used the tapping mechanic have renamed it just to stay clear, or they might have still have a trademark on tap, I don't know, on the word tap. Um, just there are more legal complexities than gelatinous rupert these other two guys presented so don't take that advice at face value please um so so i'm gonna go on this from the beginning 1.0a said you have a perpetual but not irrevocable license and everybody's up in arms and saying oh well that means they can revoke it no the only way that license can legally be revoked is if you violate the terms of the license by either not including the license in your publication, by not citing, by not including the copyright uh, portion of the games you're in that you have used. So if you use Darkstream Publishing's game, you have to use their copyright and stick it in your, I think, Section 13. Um, or by indicating directly compatibility with Dungeons & Dragons. I think those are the only three things you can do, 
And in that case, uh, if you're found out, you'll be sent a cease and desist order and you'll have to uh, literally shred all unsold copies of your uh, material. This has happened. Companies have had to do this. So under those th three things, if you say this is compatible with Dungeons and Dragons, if you do not include the copyright license, or if you don't include the OGL license at all in your work, your you, ability to use the OGL, that license is revoked. But those are the only way that license can be revoked. So it's not an irrevocable license. Okay? That is why they're phrasing this as an update to the license, is they're trying to get around it. But in the OGL itself, they say you can use any authorized license. So this new OGL is trying to say this is the only authorized license. There is one point of dispute. And this is the only thing that may be saving anybody choosing to use the license. Remember, if you choose to use the OGL, you are bound by the OGL. If you choose to use 1.0a, you are bound by 1.0a. So that's why everybody's talking about stopping using 1.0a. So all my advice about not copying tables directly, all my advice about not using the text of the SRD, rephrasing everything, and renaming mechanics just as a caution. Um, those three things apply to if you decide not to use the OGL and not, but still using D&D mechanics. If you don't use the OGL, those three pieces of advice you should absolutely listen to. Maybe with the renaming of mechanics, you might not have to so much. There might be in specific names or cases, things you can get away with. You know, you can say, well, armor class is used everywhere, so I shouldn't have to be sued over it. And you're probably right. You shouldn't have to be sued over it. That doesn't mean they won't sue you over it. This new Wizards of the Coast with this new philosophy of extract the maximum amount of money and potentially put anyone making free D&D &D out of business, they might decide to sue you anyway. And if you can't, if you don't have the money to hold them off, I mean, $600 an hour is a lot of money. And most lawyers will say, yes, I will take your case on for $5,000 retainer. If you don't have $5,000 to hand a lawyer up front, well, that's not a hypothetical figure, by the way. My lawsuit, I had to pony up $5,000 up front. That's a lot of money. Um, you uh, should listen to those pieces of advice if you're not going to use the OGL. And also, Megabuster Shepard says... Develop your own systems, lads. That's not a bad idea. Um, so, yeah, don't use the OGL if you're not going to use it. Use those three pieces of advice. If you are going to use the OGL, just remember that the only way it can be revoked is by doing those three stupid things. So don't do those three stupid things. Always include the license. Always include the copyright. Um, uh, the copyright of whoever's work you're incorporating. Make sure not to incorporate any work that is closed. Only include work that is specifically declared open. And do not, under any circumstances, indicate direct compatibility with D&D. That's why everyone is saying this uh, product is compatible with the oldest role-playing game or 
this uh, work is compatible with um, the third edition of the oldest role-playing game. You don't say D&D. You just, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Be smart. If you're going to use it, either consult a lawyer directly or go to some of these discussions that happened in 2000 or around the release of 5. Fifth edition, which I'm given to understand, uses the same or generally the same OGL. Um, and folks, my number one piece of advice I would give, please, for the love of all that is in your life, do not voluntarily join 1.1 OGL. So let me say what the little wrinkle is that I have heard. As originally announced, the leak indicated that they were going to, and, and this was my prediction, and I will hold to that this may come true eventually if they don't make enough money. My prediction was that they are going to try to force the terms of 1.1 on everybody. And the initial leak suggested that that was true. There's been a second leak that says that 1.1 is entirely voluntary. That, if you're going to write PDFs and textbooks, because those are the only things that are allowed under 1.1, Every single other thing you can imagine that might be written for D&D 1 or 6th edition, whatever it ends up being called, is forbidden. Do you want to make a module for 6th edition? You can't. A, a module on like uh, Rule 20, you can't. Forbidden. Absolutely forbidden. Let's place forbidden. Fan videos, only good if you don't make any money. That includes Kickstarter. You cannot kickstart a fan video. You can't kickstart a module to be released on uh, VTTs. You can kickstart a paper module, but if your paper module makes more than, if your Kickstarter makes more than uh, $750,000, um, any money above that is, uh, you owe them a 20% royalty. And, that, and that's the, there's been some misunderstanding about those terms. It's not 20% royalty on everything. It's a 20% royalty on everything above $750,000. Um, So 1.1 is very highly, insanely restrictive. It is not an open gaming license. Uh, that is a grotesque term to use in reference to this license. So the wrinkle is people are saying that it's entirely voluntary, that you can choose to do it, that they're not going to try to apply it to the rest of everybody else. I am saying that if that is currently the truth, that that will not remain the truth for very long. I do not believe that they will allow that to remain the truth for long. I think they're going to try to push this on everybody or drive them out of business. Furthermore, I think that $750,000 royalty cap that only affects 10 or 20 of the biggest companies, I think that's going to be pushed down at an astonishingly quickly rate, astonishingly quick rate, um, until it is, you know, I don't know that it will be applied to everybody, but I, I think it'll be dropped uh, astonishingly quickly. So, this is or will be a disaster for the third-party D&D. 
Because the only good thing about this was not that people could make stuff for D&D, is that there was an actual community of people who could make stuff for each other's games and say, yeah, this is compatible with Stars Without Number. Or, you know, this is a module meant for use with Pathfinder 1st Edition. Or use mechanics from Pathfinder. You know what? You really, really like how Pathfinder sets up their fighters? Well, now you can use mechanics for Pathfinder's fighters in your game without the chance that Pathfinder will sue you. I mean, Kevin CMB is yeah, new. It's a, a, absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, DW, I think we got to wrap up here. We're over an okay. hour and a half. I've got a hard stop time, too. All right. Kevin Sambita is notoriously um, lawsuit prone to where he sues over pictures and even mentions of his mechanics. Uh, saw somebody wrote a conversion document that allowed people to convert characters and stuff from one system to another. Kevin Sambita sued them, and because they didn't have the money to fight back, he won and took a bunch of money from them. So when you say, oh, that's wrong, well, just remember, you can get sued out of oblivion by just a bigger company, and it's happened. So I think the OGL actually had a point where people could signal to other companies, it's okay if you, if you use my mechanics or even mention my mechanics because there are people like Kevin Smita out there who have gone all jihad on something as simple as a conversion document that didn't even use any of his mechanics, just said, hey, you want to convert from uh, Rifts to this other game? Here are the, uh, here where, here's where, and, and they had like 20 different games. Here's how each of their attributes line up and what the scale is and how you can convert. So, yeah, that was disgusting. Just as disgusting what Wizards of the Coast is doing on a smaller scale. Okay, I'm done. Sir? Dorna? Are you there? Oh, Dorna left. Okay, he really did have a hard out. All right, folks. I want to say uh, thanks for everybody who listened in. Um, this has been Geek Gab for Saturday, January 7th, 2023. Um, I uh, We appreciate everyone who tuned in to listen live, and we will appreciate everyone who, uh, who will listen later. If uh, uh, we're back for the new year, we had a great Christmas break, and uh, so very grateful I am well and alive after a major major surgery thanks everybody for your prayers and uh don't we are signing off for today but don't you worry don't you fret as i promised last time despite knowing what was up ahead of me we will be back